and my eyes were rolled back in my head my face was turning purple Damn. and i was having a full-blown seizure We were doing clearing operations, going village to village, sweeping through, looking for insurgents. I remember thinking, I need to climb up on this. It was an RG-33, big truck sits, I don't know, what would you say, 12, 13 feet off the ground. The next thing I know is a medevac bird is landing on my face. And at this point, I'm conscious, I've got an IV in, and I looked at my medic and I was like, I'm not fucking getting on that helicopter. All of the regular army doctors left the room and the SF med team that we had came in and they told me, hey, we think you had a seizure, but if we report this as a seizure, your career's over. So we're going to write this off as you were dehydrated, sleep deprived, and you passed out. And you're going to go back out to your team. And we're just going to hope that this doesn't happen again. Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's both an honor and a pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast. He spent a better part of 11 years in the United States Army. He's got four combat deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan. He's got a Bronze Star Legion of Merit. He was a comms guy and on the dive team. Uh, in 2015, he was medically retired because of TBI and seizures. In 2016, he was hit by a car while training for an Ironman. In 2020, he got a flesh-eating bacterial infection, spent 10 months in the hospital, and had 30 surgeries. You're a good luck charm, by the way. Uh, <laughs> he became an Ironman coach and rode 5,500 miles over 170 hours from Washington to Florida to raise money for suicide awareness and non-pharma treatments for vets. He is also inspired the lyrics for the Tom Petty song where he talks about that Indiana boy on an Indiana night. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Zach Garner. Thanks for having me, Mike. Thanks for coming. I, uh, I'm really stoked on this episode. I mean, I'm, I'm stoked on all of them, but I, you know, in, in kind of seeing the highlights that uh, all of the things that you've been through, there's this recurring theme of resilience, which I know we're going to get into, but um, man, you, you read that and you're just like, Dude, are you a fucking part cat? Like with the nine lives? Like what? Like if I am, I think I'm like seven or eight yeah. into it. I mean, it reminds me of the uh, uh, cousin Eddie saying, "Well, if that cat had nine lives, he just spent fucking all of them." <laughs> uh, I mean, Jesus, like you've been you've been through it. Um, what is your favorite childhood memory? Ooh, good question. Um, taking road trips with the family. And my dad was a huge fan of sticks. And for the band some sticks? Yeah. And no, just pieces yeah. of wood. Yeah. No. <laughs> I mean, there, there's weirder shit out there. We just collected sticks. Yeah, yeah we walk around, go get that stick. Um, yes, the band sticks. And I remember we'd be on the road trip. And for whatever reason, when I was like five years old, like I always loved the song Come Sail Away. So whenever it would come on, I like over time learned the lyrics and I'd belt it out. Now it's like my go-to karaoke song. <laughs> I got to see that shit. Yeah. Do you have any of that on video we can put into the show? I'm actually pretty sure I do. Right. I was just uh, in uh, Saipan yeah, uh, like two months ago. And of course, when you're in a country like that, karaoke is a big thing. Yeah. yeah. So we went out, we did some, some karaoke that and Bon Jovi's living on a prayer. Yeah. Classics. Oh yeah. Fucking young guns. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> what's the last book that you read and actually finished? Martian. Martian. Yeah. With, uh, based, you know, the movie with Matt Damon, um, was based on that <laughs> and he's in Mars, gets stranded by himself, has to use his own knowledge to figure out how to <laughs> create an ecosystem that he can live off of until the next mission that's scheduled to go to Mars shows up and can rescue him. Have you seen, I'm assuming you've seen the movie. I never saw the movie. Really? Yeah. I was going to say, I wonder if the uh, the classic book is better than the movie, but the movie is pretty good. It also reminds me of, uh, there was a statistic of uh, movie-wise, how much the U.S. government has spent on trying to save Matt Damon. Because you've got <laughs> Saving Private Ryan, you've got The Martian, you've got Interstellar, and I think there's uh, another one. I mean, I guess you could... Uh, if you if you count all the Jason Bourne was films, was he in too. that one with uh, with the exoskeleton? 
exoskeleton. There was like, there's like the war on Earth and the rich people left I th- Earth. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I th- think that was Matt Damon. There's like too. half a dozen movies plus all the born ones. Like the U.S. government, movie wise, has spent like forty billion dollars trying to get Matt Easily. Damon out of out of hell. But um, <laughs> what's the most Indiana thing you can think of? Corn. Corn. That's Iowa shit. <laughs> same. Same with. Uh, same with Indiana. Huh? Corn and uh, racing cars. Yeah. Fucking A racing cars. Did you grow up racing cars? No, but we were big fans of the Indy 500. Yeah. So my mom and dad would have their friends from out of town would come in for the Indy 500. We'd have big block parties where everybody's out in the cul de sac, yeah. grilling, drinking, shucking yeah. corn, sweet corn at the end of summer, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I will say, uh, and I know you can attest to this, like growing up, I mean, there really is nothing like sweet corn at the end of of summer in the midwest like the the corn that comes from there like soaked in butter and fucking sea salt is uh it's un. i mean corn just doesn't taste the same anywhere else you know absolutely like and especially the state fair corn yeah where they like paint the butter on with a paintbrush yeah yeah that shit's incredible oh man it's like candy um what uh what is your more well actually before we get into your morning routine when you talk about racing was uh was like hot rod street racing big in, in indiana growing up it was. We didn't do a lot of that. It was more focused around the Indy 500. Yeah. I did get really heavy into that when I was stationed up in New York. I had a couple buddies that had some muscle cars, and we would take trips out on the weekends to the drag strip, and I'd help as much as I could in the pit crew in between yeah. their runs, getting the cars ready for the next That's runs. Cool. Was it eight, eighth mile or quarter mile? Uh, that was quarter mile. What was the fastest quarter mile time? Do you remember? I want to say this guy, Dan, that I knew, Dan Tyner, he had this 63 Ford Falcon that was just fucking ridiculous. And I think there was probably over 200 grand into this car. And I think he was running sub eights, possibly. It was Dude, a fucking absurd. rocket. Yeah. <laughs> Man, that's fucking wild. That's some Hoonigan shit. Oh, yeah. All right. Hey guys, I want to take a a second to talk about ads. Um, And this is not an ad. This is me talking about the ads. I know that, um, you know, sometimes we get comments of of people bitching about the ads. There's too many ads or they're too long or what have you. And I I want to clear two things up, which is number one is that my slash our team's ability to bring you guests and and bring them in and and the accommodations and, and the entire process that it takes to produce these shows to the level with which we do uh, requires funding, you know, and the, the sponsors give us an ability to bring these shows to you. So while I understand that everybody wants zero ads and, and everything bunched together and and what have you, this is how we, we bring this show to you. Uh, you know, we're a very small team. We're very fortunate to, to be able to do it. Uh, but we do still have to, uh, to pay bills and, and bring that to you. So keep that in mind. That's the first point. And the second point is that I can assure you with 100% accuracy is that there is not a sponsor or a product that I talk about on here that isn't something that I use. Okay. That, that I either regularly use or always use or have used. And, and I refuse to budge on that. Okay. So we, we get uh, offers for, for sponsors regularly that, that get turned down because it's not stuff that I use or would use. So Keep that in mind, uh, have a little bit of flexibility in terms of our ads and, and realize that they're products that I believe in, that I stand behind, and they're what, what make this show possible. So if you support these advertisers, these sponsors, that is supporting the show. Thank you. What are the two key components for canine success? That's effective training and proper nutrition. Fueled by Team Dog brings those two components to your family and best friend. The perfect nutritional balance that results in a higher mental acuity, energy, overall vitality, and even an improved appearance. Every product you will find in my company's store was born from the battlefield and not from the boardroom. Let my life's work help you become your dog's hero. What, uh, what is your morning routine on a, on a normal, typical um, day that you're in town and if, if, if such a thing exists? Sure. Um, I wake up. My wife actually usually wakes up ahead of me. So, But when she wakes up, I generally wake up, but I don't get out of bed right away. I'll scroll just like. That's like 
textbook not supposed to do it. It's I know. Scroll, scroll on your phone in bed. But I like read the news. I don't just like scroll Instagram and see what's going on in everybody else's life. I sit, see what happened yesterday in the country because at nighttime I really don't watch the news. I, I kind of use that for family time and. Yeah, so I'll wake up, I'll flip through some news posts and just see what's what's the latest and greatest, where our country's fucking up and where we're doing things right. And then I'll get out of bed and I always eat first before I work out, give my body something to burn. And then lately it's been getting out on the bicycle a lot. I'm training for a couple endurance races this year, mountain bike races. We'll get into it later, but I, I don't have a lot of fun on the road anymore. So I either find like a bike path or some dirt trails, yeah. go, go shred for a couple hours, listen to some podcasts, kind of grow my brain while I'm out there. And then I come home, eat again, shower, change. I have to like to get my mind in in the mood to or, or in the zone to do productive work i can't i'm not one of those people who can just sit around in shorts and a t-shirt or sweatpants like i have to like actually get dressed and like right. now i'm ready to go to work yeah so then i sit behind the computer it's either prepping for an upcoming speaking engagement that i have prepping for a podcast or listening to podcasts by that host just so i have an idea of their interview style um coordinating plans for future events but i knock that out and then walk the dogs my wife we have two dogs but they can't walk together because it's like a race both of them want to be in front and it's just not fun so she takes one dog for a walk i'll take the other one and then what kind of dogs are they so i've got an american pit bull lyle lyle is 110 pounds he's just a huge tank but he's scared of his own shadow no reason for that. He wasn't abused. We got him as a puppy. He wasn't like a fighting dog. He could have been because he's ginormous. His head's like 40 pounds. But, um, and Lyle's my baby. So we've got him and then we've got Bojangles, who is a Kangal that I brought back from Iraq in 2019. Oh, shit. Yeah. Damn, that's wild. Yeah. They get along, all right? They get along good. Every once in a while, there will be a fight over a toy or a treat, yeah. but it never like gets to the point where blood's drawn or anything yeah. like that. We just have to separate them. Usually if we just open the back door, they'll sprint out there and then it turns into play wrestling. Yeah. It's only when it's inside. Yeah. That's classic. Um, you mentioned you eat before you work out. What do you typically eat? So I'll do, I do the collagen coffee. Um, I use bubs products actually. Nice. Yeah. And so I'll do bubs with the collagen and the MCT creamer, I'll have that. And then usually some eggs and bacon, nothing too big, but just I like to have some substance in my body yeah. because then I'll go out and if I'm doing a longer bike ride, I don't want to stop and have to worry about nutrition until I'm 25, 30 miles into that. Yeah. So I just like to have something in my system before I take off on it. Yeah. So then when you get back, are you, do you subscribe to, you know, lower carb or like cycling it where it's like you, go on no carbs when you go into the workout and then do carbs afterwards or you just eat whatever or eat whatever yeah i work out so that i can enjoy what i'm eating yeah. i love chicken wings yeah <laughs> <laughs> right on <laughs> um all right so you mentioned the two dogs um you walked the two dogs and and uh i, I do want to dig into how you got that kangle uh, home and, and that whole process but i'd like to come back to that when we kind of get get to that part of the interview um, so you grew up in Indiana. Um, if you could kind of summarize your childhood, siblings, sports that you played, just kind of the overall experience of, of growing up in the 80s and 90s in Indiana. Sure. Um, so I was actually born in Illinois, and that was very brief. My family, my dad was in the military. He was stationed in El Paso at Fort Bliss at the time. And... My mom had already had one miscarriage. They thought that I would also be a miscarriage, but there was a way to get around it, but the military hospital wasn't willing to do it. They were just like, if you lose your baby, you lose your baby. So she went and stayed with her best friend in Illinois and had me up there. Doctors did whatever it was that they needed to do to make sure I was born. And after a couple months when I, you know, those posts, 
doctor's appointments were done. They said, hey, you're good to go. We went back to El Paso and lived there for a couple of years and then relocated to Indiana. So I want to say around four years old, three, four years old was when we went to Indiana. Yeah. I did preschool and kindergarten and first and second grade at one school. Then we moved houses and I did third through 12th in another school district. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that was, that was living in Indiana, but I, I grew up with an older sister. My mom was a nurse. My dad was in the military. He retired when I was probably nine years old, eight, nine years old, I want to say. What did he do in the military? He was an 11 Bravo, um, did three tours in Vietnam, came back, continued as an 11 Bravo for a while, then got put on recruiting duty and was actually really good at it. So they made him an instructor at the recruiting schoolhouse. For those that don't know, 11 Bravo is... Infantryman, yeah. And uh, so three tours in Vietnam, did he talk much uh, about that growing up? Like, was that a an influence for you? He, <clears throat> my younger years, he didn't. Um, we, I remember watching the movie Platoon with my dad. Really? Yeah. As, to be intense. as a young child. And <clears throat> asking questions that probably put him out of his comfort zone because I just wanted to understand and he gave me the answers, but you could tell it was like a scrubbed version mm -hmm. of the answers. And then when I got older, he started to open up a lot more. Like I remember kind of is as cheesy as the story sounds. I remember going and seeing Black Hawk Down with my father in the theater. And that was what, like when that spark went off in my head that like maybe this is what I want to do. Yeah. And so once I voiced that to him, then he had a lot more genuine conversations and real conversations with me about that. Yeah. Is there a, a story that he shared with you that stands out in your mind as being the most impactful? Um, so I remember he went on vacation with my stepmom and got they were just goofing off and they got temporary tattoos and he got this eye on his shoulder. And I was like that, you know, I was like 15 and was like, that's pretty cool. I want to get something like that tattooed on me one day, like every 15 year old boy does. Yeah. And he was like, no, you don't. And I was like, well, why not? And he was like, because the reason I got this, you don't want to ever have to deal with that. And then he went on to tell me that when they would kill people, they would cut their eyes out and put them in their cargo pocket. And that's how they would count their, their kills at the end of the day, based on how many eyeballs they had. Wow. Yeah. And how did you respond to that? It was eye opening for sure. <laughs> no pun intended. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Man. Yeah. How old were you? Do you remember about when he told me that I was probably 14, 15 years yeah. old. Yeah. Were you like, I'm not fucking with my dad or did you already feel that way? I already felt that way. Like he, he definitely, laid down the law in the house yeah yeah as i got older he he became a lot more relaxed as a father um he held me to high standards when i was young but then as i started to develop my own personality and everything and he saw traits of himself in me i think he started to trust like okay he's on the right path and and he also was fair like i think some parents and i try to be this way with my daughter I think some parents are helicopter parents. You know, we oh, use yeah. that term all the time. And they try to keep their kids from getting into any sort of situation. And they try to protect them for as long as they can. And my dad was like, you're going to make mistakes. I did. Yeah. You are. And I need to allow you to make those mistakes. Mm -hmm. So he loosened up a lot. And he gave me a lot of freedom to, to make mistakes. You know, I didn't really have a curfew. I didn't, they didn't really, I moved. So I moved from my mom's house to my dad's house full time during like the summer between sophomore and junior year of high school, because me and my dad just got along better than me and my mom, my mom. Great. 
nothing bad to say about her. She did her best. We just didn't have a lot in common. And me and my dad did at this point. Yeah. We enjoyed doing the same things. We enjoyed hanging out together. He would, even on school nights, like it would just be like Wednesday after school, I'm upstairs playing video games or whatever the case may be. And he would come in and be like, hey, so-and-so, some Def Leppard's in town tonight. You want to go to the <laughs> concert? And we would just get in the car and go buy tickets from a ticket scalper and go see Def Leppard. Yeah, on, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'm curious, uh, child rearing wise, when you reflect back now as a father, um, t- I guess it's kind of a two part question. One, was he, were there expectations of you chore wise, keeping your room clean? Like, or, or was it just like no curfew fucking, you know, as long as your grades are passing, like what, what were the kind of left and right flanks as far as that goes? And do you emulate that or do you, are there things that you look back and say, well, I, you know, I'll take this from that, uh, but I want to do this instead. Or like, how do you reconcile that? So there wasn't really a curfew in like the few times that he, if, if, if there was a curfew, it was a very loose cur- curfew. I remember one specific incident where I was out and I think it was summertime. So I didn't have school the next day or anything, but he was just, Hey, be home by midnight. And I was like, okay, but I know my dad, my dad goes to bed at like nine o'clock and there had been multiple times prior to this where I came home well after midnight and he never knew. But on this one specific night, I remember I wandered in around like 3 (laughs) a.m. That's not just a little late. (laughs) And, and dad was sitting on the couch and he was just like, do you have a good night? (laughs) And, and I was like, yeah, "Yeah, sorry. I, I lost track of time, you know? Not the truth. I was making yeah. out with a girl. Yeah. But um, he didn't really punish me for that. He was just like, just be aware that I might be up at any time and don't take this for granted. Yeah. And and I learned from that because the next time I was out, I made sure I was home. Yeah. So, yeah, but there were like cleaning my room, things like that, helping out around the house, picking up after yourself. Those were very strictly enforced before I was, when I was younger, before going out with my friends. And even up until high school, it was like, we have to get this done around the house, whether that's mowing the grass, cleaning the garage, whatever, before you go out, this is what you have to do. Yeah. And that instilled a mindset in me that I carry on even today where if I know what I have to accomplish today, I'm going to bust my ass to try to get that done as quick as possible so I can move on to what I want to do yeah. afterwards. Yeah. And so, you know, and in the military, that doesn't always serve you because if you bust your ass and get it done, there's always something else yeah. for you to do afterwards and you end up just doing a lot more work. It's like prison laundry. <laughs> yeah. yeah, It's like the scene from, uh, I think it's American History X where Edward Norton and uh, this black guy are doing doing laundry together and he's getting all pissed off. And uh, the guy's like, dude, what are you fucking s- slow down? Like you finish that, they're going to bring another fucking load. Just Yeah, we're like, here all day regardless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's yeah. funny. Do you, uh, so do you, try to mirror that parenting style or, or have you modified it? Um, I do try to mirror that. I hold my daughter to standards. Funny story. So recently she's probably not going to listen to this. So I don't mind putting her out on blast. Um, How old is she? 16. 16. Yeah. So she, I was in Dallas actually. This was probably two months ago. And my wife, called at like two in the morning which is unheard of she goes to bed super early so i'm like what's going on i pick up the phone she's like scout's not here and my car's gone and i was like well you know we've got like the tracker on her the app yeah life 360 we can see where she's at she turned it off so about 30 45 minutes later she finally turned it back on and I sent her a text message and all I said was, what are you thinking? And she knew right away and she didn't try to deny it. She didn't try to make an excuse. She just said, I know I messed up. And so we grounded her for that because I think also it's different with girls and boys. Yeah, for sure. And, and so <laughs> as a father and I'm her stepfather, but I have, raised her since she was three years old. So I think of her as my own kid. I have no biological kids of my own. And I just, 
I want to protect her. And I know that there are boys out there that don't yeah. give a shit about that because yeah. I didn't give a shit about that when I was that age. Yeah. I know there's boys like me out there. Yeah. So it's my job to try to protect her as much as I can from that. And so that's something that, you know, it's different from how I was raised, but I feel like it's necessary. Yeah. And I think she learned her lesson. She, she was grounded for like six weeks. And then instead of going on spring break to Florida, we were all going to go to Florida and she was going to be able to go hang out with her friends and we would do our thing. Instead of doing that, she, I was an instructor for a, a youth survival course and she got voluntold to join the youth survival course and oh, she got to go fuck around the woods with me for yeah, the weekend. That's cool. Yeah. Man, that's pretty wild. <laughs> Which but is not, if you knew her personality, that's her enough of a punishment. Yeah. 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 Is, uh, is that six week grounding, is that her phone taken from her? During certain hours it is, <clears throat> but it's, you go to school and you come home from school, you go to work and you come home from work. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. The gym, if she wants to go to the gym, we would allow that too. Yeah. But that was it. There was no personal time with friends. Yeah. 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 It's uh, it's wild now, you know, in today's day and age with trying to navigate grounding kids and phones versus not and internet usage and, you know, social media and, and that kind of stuff. It's like, it's, it's, there's no, there's no way to win. Like it's just a lose, lose, you know, it's like you take shit from them and then they use their friends' phones at school or mm -hmm. like, you know, to me, I, I don't think phones should be allowed in school, honestly. Like I, I really don't. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there needs to be some, some better system. Like I'm not saying don't take them like, cause it, it makes sense from a communication standpoint to be able to get a hold of them. But like, whether it's a basket at the beginning of fucking classes or, or whatever, like I, I just don't, it baffles me the shit that goes on in public schools now with phones and, and I mean, it's like, they don't do shit. It's like prison almost like just people just sitting around fucking off, not doing anything productive. Yeah. Like it boggles my mind how, how far our public education system has backslid in this country. Mm -hmm. Um, all right. So <clears throat> Black Hawk down, uh, is a, is an inspirational, um, or, or kind of a light switch moment for you. Did you join uh, the Army right out of high school? I fucked around for about eight months. Mm -hmm. um, I was playing in a punk rock band in Indiana. Really enjoyed it. And, I mean, you know, we were we were playing shows pretty much every weekend. What was the name? The Hooligans. The Hooligans. That's yeah. A good name. Um, we had some, some great hits such as one, two, three, four, fuck you. That was, that was always <laughs> our closer. Um, <laughs> you still play that? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. And my wife knows when I'm playing it too, <laughs> and she'll start singing it in the background. That's awesome, man. Um, That's great. but yeah, I was playing music and I was generally not going home. I would stay my bass player and drummer were brothers and they had an apartment together and I would generally just couch crash at their house because we would drink at the shows and then I yeah. didn't want to go home drunk. So I just stay on their couch and, um, I was working two part-time jobs, playing shows on the weekends. And one day I realized like, I don't want this forever. <clears throat> what jobs were you working? I was working as a dishwasher bus boy at a restaurant and pack sun was uh, in the mall. Oh shit. Was the uh, was the restaurant an Indiana chain? Like was it was a national chain? It was uh Indiana chain. They had like two or three locations. It was called the Sunrise Cafe. It was like a, a breakfast lunch spot yeah. closed at two thirty PM. That's cool. So I had my evenings free to go do practice and then yeah. play shows on the weekends. Yeah. Yeah. So punk rocker walks into an army recruiter and says, Hey, what do you got for me? So originally I walked into the Coast Guard recruiter. Really? Yeah. Fucking puddle pirates? Yeah. All right. um, I told my dad because he worked no in the recruiting command. No disrespect to the command. Coast Guard. Right. I love the Coast Guard. But. He worked in the recruiting command. So I consulted with my father first and said, hey, I'm thinking about joining the military. And he was like, no, you, you don't need to do that. I did that for our family so that you don't have to. And we were already at war at this point. So, because this was 2004. 
And he, so he was like, no, absolutely not. Mm. So at first I took his feelings into account and he said, what about the Coast Guard? And I was like, well, let me look into it. Started doing my research, saw the, um, what do they call them? ASTs? The, the guys that jump out of the helicopter. The rescue swimmers. The rescue swimmers. Yeah. I was like, I would do this. I'd be okay with that. That'd be some wild shit. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And yeah. I love being in the water. I love the adrenaline rush. The water doesn't scare me. So we went into the Coast Guard recruiter. They were like, okay, let's get you over to MEPS. So I went over to MEPS. I did my physical. I did my ASVAB testing. Went back to the recruiter, and they're like, hey, your scores are high enough. You can have whatever job you want. So I pointed to the poster on the wall that said, that has the guy jumping out of the helicopter and a boat's capsized, and I was like, that's what I want to do. And they were like, awesome. And they left it at that. <laughs> The next week, they called me, and they said, hey, we, we got you a basic training date. And this was, like, March of 2004. And they said, you go to basic training in November. And I was like, well, what I don't What am I supposed to do for six months? Yeah. yeah. I was like, I'm ready to leave tomorrow. And then they went even further. I was like, okay, how long is this pipeline then? And they said, well, so you're going to go to basic, and then you're going going to get put at whatever the Coast Guard needs. And then when a slot becomes available, then you'll go to rescue school. Yeah. And I was like, well, how long is that generally? Well, yeah, it could be. Could be two years, I found out. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, fuck no. Yeah. Wind up in Nantucket for two years. So I called my dad as soon as I hung up with him, and I was like, hey, we're going to go talk to the Army recruiter. I'm 18 you can be a part of this if you want to be, or I can go do it myself. So he came around and he said, I'll go with you. So we went, we, uh, we talked to the army recruiter and again, they, because I'd already taken my ass lab in like the last three weeks, they were like, we can use that score. You're good for whatever you want. So my dad still wanted to control the situation a little bit. So he was like, I'm not going to, less off on you being an 11 bravo so i went into the artillery world initially and that was solely based because with that mos they gave me station of choice and a fourteen thousand dollar bonus wow so i was like all right yeah and so i chose to be a 13 mike originally an mlrs crew member only did that for about a year and a half and realized like what is mlrs multiple launch rocket systems so it's a tank with rocket pods on the back you can take out grid squares but it's very rarely used nowadays yeah. kind of outdated so once i got in there i realized this wasn't for me i reclassed immediately to ford observer because i found out that ford observers get attached to infantry units and essentially you get to go do all the operations that they go on. You just have a radio on your back and you can call for fire if shit hits the fan. So went to that school, got certified as a Ford observer and then continued on from there. Yeah. All right, guys, there's no getting around this fact. I carry, uh, a lot of people carry. Uh, if you do carry, you need to train. No different than fighting or uh, you know striking, shooting. It's all the same stuff. You, you have to train. Proficiency and safety are two things uh, that matter most, uh, and I'm excited to talk about this sponsor, this new sponsor called Strike Man. Uh, if you've seen competitive shooters practicing timing drills on the range, imagine being able to do that at home. That's what you can do with Strike Man. Anytime you want without spending a dime on ammo, uh, that's what Strike Man does. It's a laser firearm training system that uses a laser cartridge, a target and phone app that catch, captures all of your shots. The system's available in 16 different calibers from 9 mil to 223 to 556. You can compete with friends, do clearing drills, use the timer to test your reaction speed, all while the system scores your accuracy. It's a great, great way to dry fire and stay sharp without having to go to the range and waste ammo. Uh, right now, you can get 25% off by using the code RITLAND. That's one word, R-I-T-L-A-N-D when you go to trainwithstrikeman.com. It's not an easier or more cost-effective way to do it. Again, that's trainwithstrikeman.com. Trainwithstrikeman.com. Offer code is RITLAND, all one word. All right, as you guys know, the 
lifestyle changes and the, the fast pace that we live, uh, it makes it difficult to get in, uh, you know, all of the vitamins, minerals, fruits, vegetables, etc. cetera. Uh, started working with First Form. Uh, it's a great company. Uh, everybody knows who they are, and, and uh, I've been trying their stuff for a while now, and I, I love it. Uh, in particular, their Opti Greens 50. It's a precisely formulated green superfood powder uh, that increases overall immune system support and digestive health. Uh, 80% of your immune system is located in your gut and digestive tract, so healthy digestion is essential for overall health and wellness. It's got 50 hand-chosen ingredients, um, and it's taste and texture like no other product. It's not gritty. It's got a sweet berry flavor. Uh, 100% of all the greens ingredients are grown and manufactured in the USA. Um, you know, for me, this is a, a really good one-stop shop to uh, to get all the extra stuff that you need. There's a lot of greens out there. This is uh, a product I stand behind. I take. I enjoy it, uh, and and notice a remarkable difference in uh, just overall the way that I feel. My my gut health and digestion is uh, is noticeably improved. It's a green superfood blend. It's a phytonutrient blend. Uh, it's a glycemic balance blend. It's not going to spike your your blood sugar. It's got digestive enzyme blends and probiotics in it. It's a great product. Uh, Andy Frazella and, and First Form is a phenomenal company that uh, you know is very supportive of the veteran community. And, uh, I just, I can't say enough good things about him and the company. So Opti Greens 50, uh, just a, a great product. And, uh, they're, they're a fantastic sponsor and supporter of Mike Drop. Uh, did you do any artillery work? As far with the 13 Mike, the yeah. MLRS training missions, shooting dummy rockets, <laughs> that so, sort of thing. A lot of time in Hohenfels. So if I may, uh, deviate for just a quick second so when i was in iraq uh, i was sitting on saddam hussein's rooftop in in his hometown in tikrit of, of the palace so i'm like you know fucking fire watch balls to four you know middle of the night and all of a sudden there's blips of artillery going off you know half a mile or however fucking far away off in the distance and they hit you know five six hundred meters south of us and three more blips they're fucking 300 and that, so they're walking them in on us and the the last triplet that was you know 50 70 yards away i mean 100 maybe um on the back side of uh the river behind us all of a sudden this fucking transformers sounding whiz bang you know optimus prime having a fucking orgasm sound <laughs> happens and and then you just hear whoa, 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 like and then where those blips of lights were coming from mm -hmm. just fucking disappeared I'm assuming that's some sort of counter artillery that I didn't even know fucking existed. We didn't even know they were there. Fucking yep. glad it wasn't poisonous or enemy because we'd have been we'd have been fucked. Like we didn't even know they were there. Do you know what what the fucking deal with that technology is? Can you speak to it at all? Because I still don't know what the fuck happened. That could have definitely been an MLRS system. What years was this? This was '03. I mean, it was right yeah. at the start. So yeah, so we were we were still using them in country at that time. So if we had a position where they were, we knew artillery like enemy artillery was coming from we could set that thing and it's it's pretty precise and one launcher can take out a whole grid square with the rockets that it carries but is there some sort of uh radar or similar technology because we didn't like i said we didn't even know they were there so we didn't communicate like does it pick up that there's fucking artillery going and and it responds in kind not automatically not that I was ever exposed to. So we had our FTC team that would give us the grid location and we put that into the computer system and it adjusts and moves so that it's lined up and then yeah. launches those missiles. Wow. Like I said, to this day, I still have no idea who it was, how, how, how it happened, but they, they a hundred percent saved our fucking lives. I mean, no, no two ways about it, mm -hmm. you know, wild shit. Um, all right. So, you, you skirt that, uh, you get into the Forward Observer stuff. What was your takeaway from the Forward Observer program, and, and how would you summarize it? I really enjoyed it because, one, it was the people were a lot more like my people as far as, as the regular Army goes. It was because I got attached to a light infantry unit as a Forward Observer, so we were doing long foot movements. We were doing long patrols and I got to be on those patrols because I've got the radio and if I need to call for mortar fire or if we've got fast movers coming in, I was JFO qualified so we could 
I could talk to the birds and get bombs dropped on target. So I, I enjoyed that a lot more because it felt like I was part of the mission as opposed to sitting in a tank, not yeah. facing the fight, mm-hmm. you know, uh, multiple grid squares away. Yeah. I wanted to experience war up close and in and, and my face. Yeah. And that allowed me to have that opportunity because, you know, prior to getting on the radio and calling in for those mortar strikes, I'm in the gunfight as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you did, right? You went to Iraq with that group. Yep. I, yeah. That was with 10th Mountain Division, um, 2006, 2007. When it was about as hot as it ever was. Yeah. You know, so what was that like? It was an interesting deployment. I, so my company, we did an air assault into this village called Rushdie Mula. And initially it was supposed to just be like three days on the ground, just clearing operations, searching houses for middle-aged males, putting their information into the biometric system, searching the house for guns, any bomb making supplies, whatever, and then taking and and holding on to whoever we found that shit on. So at the end of that three days, though, long firefight took place from this house. We ended up killing everybody inside that house and then got a call from headquarters that said, hey, you guys are going to stay there. We're going to send reinforcements in to help build that place up because obviously there's shit going on in that town. Uh, how many uh, enemy targets were there? That house, I want to say, had over 10. Yeah. Yeah. And they were just popping out of windows, rooftops, everything. So we took care of them in a prolonged firefight that went through the night. Can you can you walk us through that a little bit, um, how that firefight went down? Like, what were you on your way to that objective, and then you got kind of ambushed or pop shot? Or, like, how, how did that shake out? So the town... It's kind of in a linear, maybe quarter mile wide by one, one and a half miles long. And we started at one end and we're just sweeping through going house to house. And this particular house was on the eastern side, I believe. Don't quote me on that. To my right in the direction we were moving. And started taking small arms fire Couldn't really tell where it was coming from initially. Got down. It would stop. We would get up. It would pick up again. And then there were guys coming from windows. There were guys on the rooftop. And eventually it got to the point where it was like, hey, we we can't just be shooting at this house blindly. We need to go make an entrance into this house. And so that's what we did. We moved over. At the time, we were probably 100, 150 meters away when it kicked off. Slowly just bounding, moved our way up to that house, and then just started stacking on doors and going through. How many of you were there? So the whole company minus headquarters um, was out there. There were some headquarters attachments, but um, so probably, I don't know, 60 of us roughly. Yeah. Um and we kept guys outside to watch for squirters, anything like that, people that were trying to exit and run away from the house so we could detain them. But, yeah, we we made entry into the house and then just room by room methodically clearing. Yeah. And, you know, nobody really stopped fighting. So it was as soon as we made entry, it was just kill them. Yeah. How, I mean, when you look back, I mean, having gone through selection and gone the special operations route for a while after that, how do you compare going through that with that company versus your time at uh, in special forces? So a later event that took place on that same deployment is what led me into special operations. So we had been there for probably eight, nine months. Man, and this was, this was a, a 15, 16 month deployment total. Man, so, and, and a side note about that. So we took this house unintended, like 
the original intent was not to stay there. It was to be in that village for three days and then get picked up by birds and head out. We ended up staying there. So with that being said, there was no infrastructure built to support us. So they started sending out truckloads of HESCO barriers, and we had some construction equipment that was helping fill those. But you bet your ass we were out there with shovels digging and filling HESCO barriers with dirt also. What did you guys do with the dead bodies? Uh, Put them on a truck, and they they got bust out somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, A, like, deuce and a half came in. We loaded them up and did off you, they went. Did you guys, uh, sensitive site wise, dig through, gather intel from any of them on their person? I mean, we searched them, took any IDs, everything like that, pictures of them. Is anything surprising? No. And at that point, though, too, I was just a, a brand new buck sergeant. Yeah. So there might have been, but I might not have been exposed to it. Yeah. That might have been that might have led to why they kept us there for so long. Um, any laptops, anything like that, thumb drives. Thumb drives were still like rare. Everybody had hard drives, but like the little mini thumb drives were so anything like that that we found, we sent off somebody more important and smarter than me analyzed all that. Did you find anything weird? Anything you're like, what the fuck? Not on, not. Or like in the building? Not on that one. Yeah. Um, I did have one house that I went through, and this was on, on a different trip, but we cleared into the house and we came in, and as soon as we walked into the room, there's a man and a woman having sex. Really? In the bed. Which, of course, like, is going to, you're attention's immediately going to go right there yeah and like what the fuck is this and it was completely set up they did that on purpose to distract us wow. so as soon as we came in we're looking over here at the bed there was a closet to the right and a guy pops out of the closet with an ak and just starts opening fire man yeah dude that's fucking wild what uh i mean was it like i'm just gonna ask i mean what what fucking position were they in what were they doing she was on top. Yeah, like totally naked, no sheets, nothing to, to try to get as much attention on them as yep. possible. Yeah. Did uh, did it work? Did they get? Did they end up getting any of your guys? Surprisingly, nobody got shot except for the guy that jumped out of the closet. Wow. I can't even imagine, like... It was like the John Travolta and yeah. Samuel L. Jackson in Pulp Fiction. <laughs> yeah. Like, this dude just yeah, comes out crazy. spraying with an AK. He and messes everybody. Yeah. Wow. That's fucking wild, man. Um. Jesus. What, uh, all right. So I didn't, I don't mean to get you sidetracked talking about, uh, uh t- you know, talking about weird shit, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> so you, you, you end up on that same deployment. You're in, uh, you, you go on another operation that led to, to why you wanted to be in special operations. So I was in Bravo company and our Delta company element was down the road and there was this huge orchard that surrounded their compound they were on like this three-story what i would consider an iraqi mansion and at nighttime they would send out two view there was one road house was on the left as you're driving in that one road the orchards were so thick that at nighttime people could sneak through there unobserved and put an ied right on the edge of the road and then retreat and nobody would ever know until the next day when you drove by. So, and this had happened multiple times. So what they started doing was putting out blocking positions every night from sundown to sunup. One truck at each one, five guys, one dude in the turret, four guys in the truck, and they would rotate through that turret position every two hours. And, you know, the reports never said how these guys were able... uh, to sneak up so close because we had at this point, you know, you had night vision, you had thermals. And if you're looking through those, you would have seen a heat signature coming through before it got so close. But these guys got close enough that they threw makeshift incendiary devices into the turret of the truck, lighting everybody on fire. And then as they jumped out of the truck on fire, they killed them. So in that one attack, you know, and, my assumption 
and maybe I'm wrong, nobody lived, um, so we don't know. My assumption is that people fell asleep. Yeah. But they hit both trucks, incendiary devices through the turrets, killed everybody as they ran out. Um, Ten guys killed and three captured in one night. Man, that's fucking horrible. So I'm assuming the captured, they killed them too. Yeah, one we found roughly a month later. Anzac was his name, and then Fowdy and Jimenez were missing. So that was May 12th of 2007 when the attack happened, and they found them in July of 2008. Where, so, where did they find them? You know? I want to say it wasn't far from where they were captured. So it was Cargooly Village where the mission took or where the, the attack happened, and which outside Baghdad. And I don't think it was too far. A couple months after, I think they found weapons and ID cards. So they knew they've been in this area. And then they found videos of them dragging their dead bodies through the streets. And a year and two months later, recovered the bodies. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking brutal. But that completely changed our mission. Um, so May, so at that point we're like 10 months into the deployment, nine months, something along there and everything stopped and it just became personnel recovery for the rest of the time. So everything. So at that point, what we were doing was going back to Baghdad, loading up on birds, getting dropped and all the villages along the Euphrates and just going one by one and just sweeping, looking for anything that showed that they had been there or, you know, updating at that point. That was when biometrics was becoming a really big thing and we need to get everybody enrolled in this system. So taking pictures, scanning eyeballs, scanning fingers, we did that for everybody in the village. And so a very slow process. We'd get dropped off and we'd be out there for five to seven days humping on foot, no trucks, anything like that, just going house to house, doing that. And that was supported by special operations. So that was really my first exposure to working with them personally. Yeah, and gave you the uh, the soft heart on. Yeah, yeah, yeah 100%. Yeah. Uh, so what was the, the process like? So you, was the rest of that deployment just geared towards that and, and relatively non-eventful? We did lose a couple more guys. I want to say our battalion on that deployment had over 25 KIA, I think 27 KIA. So it was, a, it was a rough deployment. And to come home from that, there was a lot of third order effects that took place. You know, um, rightfully so, guys came back and weren't the same. Multiple guys from that deployment have since committed suicide. Um, a lot of, a lot of failed marriages. So yeah, it definitely took a toll on us, but the mission pretty much stayed oriented to that until we got replaced by Rakasans in July or sorry, November of 2007. Replaced by who? The Rakasans, 101st. Oh, I got you. Yeah. Um, all right. So you come home, were you rattled personally? So... Yeah, um, my things got a little bit weird. So by the time I hit 12 months in country, I still hadn't gone on R&R yet. So I was like the last group to go on R&R. And I went home for two weeks and I ended up getting stabbed while I was home. Jesus Christ. Yeah. <laughs> what the fuck? Um, what happened? So partially self-induced, I have to admit. <laughs> Um, you know, I had, I was definitely rattled coming back from that because that was like two months after those guys got captured mm -hmm. and I got home. I just wanted to go back to something normal. And where, where was home at that point? Indiana. My family okay. still lives in Indiana. Yeah. So you went like home, home, not just back to the base area. Right. Okay. Right. Went home to see my family and my girlfriend and like the day after I got home, there was a concert in town and my sister and my brother-in-law lived like a mile from the venue. So they're like, it was Kenny Chesney. I'm not a huge country music fan. You and me both. But, 
but I appreciate live music. And again, I just wanted to be around yeah. like normalcy. Yeah. I never really had, you know, some people come back and they're like, I don't want to be around big crowds. That never really affected me. I never, now it's like, I don't like being incredibly, I don't like going to the airport, but it's more because I just don't have the patience to yeah. deal with people. Yeah, I'm right there with you. Um, it's not because I am yeah. super hyper vigilant or anything like that. So they had an extra ticket to this Kenny Chesney concert, and they're like, hey, let's go. And they, like, pre-gamed. They were smoking meat all day long, had people over. We pre-partied at the house. My tolerance is super low, and I'm only, like, 22 yeah. at the time. So, but I'm drinking, like, and I had been in Germany for two years prior to this, so I had been allowed to drink since I was 19 years old. I drank like I was 19 years old in Germany again yeah, and got way too drunk, borderline like blackout. And then we walk to the concert, we get in and I immediately start running into friends from high school that I haven't seen in oh, like a year and a half or no, sorry, it's three, years. four years. <laughs> um, and they're like, oh, let me buy you a beer. You just got back from Iraq. Let me, you know, so people are buying me beers. I'm double fisting beers. And I got separated from my group. I finally, I didn't even have a cell phone at the time because this is like pre-smartphones, you know. I borrowed some random stranger's cell phone. was like, can I call my sister so I can find my friends? And they called. I couldn't even dial the number. So they, they did it for me. And they handed me the phone. And I was like, I have to pee. Meet me at the bathroom. And I'll join back up with the group. So I'm in the bathroom. Apparently... I cut somebody in line for the bathroom. There was like, a, it was a sold out concert. So there was a huge line to get in. I just pretended I didn't see the line walked in. Some guy called me out. I just gave him the bird and walked in and all the urinals were full. So I went into a stall standing up peeing and I hear a beer bottle break. I was like, <laughs> sucker. All of a sudden, the other end of that broken beer bottle comes underneath the wall, and the guy just starts shoving it repeatedly into my leg. No shit. Yeah. Jesus. So I jumped on top of the toilet seat, and I pull. I reached over the wall. I pulled his shirt over his head like a hockey fight, and then just started <laughs> punching him. And then the next thing I know, I did fully black out. And I, the next thing I remember, a cop is carrying me out of the bathroom like a baby. And my leg looks like a peeled banana. Fuck, man. And my girlfriend, who became my first wife, and my sister were standing outside. They had, like, a funnel cake and popcorn to try to sober me up. And they just, like, <laughs> dropped them on the floor. And they're like, what the fuck happened? The cop's like, I have no clue. Somebody came and told us there was a guy bleeding in the bathroom. And so you have we, no idea what happened to the dude that stabbed you? So apparently they got him oh, wow. um, because they came to the hospital and they said, hey, we have this dude. Do you want, what do you want us to do? And I didn't want an alcohol-related incident on my military record. So I was like, let him go. Do you not have any idea who it was? No. No idea. Uh, no. So, yeah, so they let him go. From what I was told, one of my friends that was with the concert at the concert with us, he was a local police officer. And his co-workers were working that concert that night. And so they're the ones that had him. So he came to the hospital and he said, hey, what do you want to do? And I told him, I said, I don't want to do anything because I don't want this tied to me. And I was like, but you guys can do what you want to do. And so he told me they made sure that he learned his lesson, whatever that means. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking old school Indiana cop style. <laughs> That's wild, man. Jesus. Uh, did that impact your ability to go back? Like, were you fucking, did you stay home? So, yeah, I ended up going back to New York and was on, you know, and at this point we only had like two and a half months left of yeah. the rotation. What did you tell the command that happened? I told him I was helping remodel a bathroom and my, there was some rebar sticking out of the wall and it caught my leg and ripped it. Wow. And they bought that, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry if you're listening. <laughs> That's fucking crazy. 
Hey guys, I wanted to uh, talk about something that I've incorporated into my daily routine, my morning routine that has had a remarkable impact on my life. Uh, it's called BioPro Plus. Uh, it's a non-synthetic HGH uh, treatment. And, uh, you know, every year after puberty, your HGH levels naturally drop uh, and exponentially sometimes uh, can even drop by, by 50% by the time you're 35. Uh, I train jujitsu three or four times a week. I lift three or four times a week. And BioPro Plus, uh, without question, uh, enhances my ability to train more uh, days per week, harder, recover faster, uh, enhance performance. I cannot say enough good things about this product. I've been taking it for a few months. Uh, it's, it's remarkable, and I will continue to, to do so. Um, if you want to, uh, you know, perform better, look better, feel better. Uh, I, I can't stress it enough. I have tried bio pro plus, uh, and I encourage you to go to bioproteintech.com uh, And if you want to get $30 off your first order, use the code Mike drop M I K E D R O P. And again, that's bioproteintech.com. I cannot stress enough. This stuff has uh, been a game changer for me as I've gotten older. Uh, so, uh, so you didn't go back. Nope. Um, not on that trip. Yeah. Yep. So what was the process like going from that to selection? So I piece, I finished, I stayed at Fort Drum for about six more months, um, got married, and decided, oh, then I came down on orders back to Germany, which I thought, yeah, let's go back. You can Now I can experience this with somebody, not just being a single dude. Because as a single dude in Germany, I just like partied yeah. a lot Was when I fun? wasn't working. Was it fun there? Yeah, 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 absolutely. I had a blast, but I didn't really soak it up. Like, I, I like the traveling, how easy it was to get to other countries. At 19, 20, 21 years old, like, no, I just wanted to go to the bars and meet girls. Yeah. So when I went back married, that was when I really, like, experienced Europe. And we went on trips to experience different cities in Germany, went to multiple different countries. It's super easy to travel over there, whether yeah. it's by train or plane. Like, Ryanair at the time, you could get from Germany to Spain or Germany to London. It was, like, $30 wow. to jump on a plane and go for the weekend. Yeah. And it's one of those where, like, if you have a carry-on, you have to pay an additional 20 There's all kinds of upcharges, but it's still yeah. cheap. Yeah. And if you're traveling within Germany, you could get certain train passes to where you could go anywhere in Germany, hop on, hop off for like four days for like 100 euros. Wow. Did you visit any uh, World War II historical sites? Um, did Eagle's Nest in Switzerland. Oh, shit. Yep. How was that? That was really cool. Yeah. Um, really interesting to just – because you can still like – you walk in there and you can just imagine what that place was like when yeah. it was at the height yeah. of everything. That's fucking creepy that you can that you can see that. Yeah, and like in Auschwitz was another one. Wow, super depressing. Oh, I can imagine. I've been to the. Uh, or I've been. I'm curious. Have you been to the uh, Holocaust Museum in in uh, D.C.? No, man. That like that's a must must yeah. see uh, museum. I've been there a couple times, and uh, man, it's powerful. I believe it. Super powerful. But yeah. I can't even imagine actually going to Auschwitz. Yeah, it's eerie because you yeah. can still go into the, the shower gas chambers. Fuck, yeah. and yeah. Um, Puts a whole different twist on everything. I think. Yeah, the yeah. smells are still there. Wow. Like you can, It still smells like death. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, on a lighter note, so, uh, so you traveled a bunch, uh, got to see some good sites. Um, where, what was the, the path after that? So... In Germany, I ended up getting DA selected, just like, you know, some people get DA selected to be drill sergeants or recruiters. And the Army says, unless you drop a packet saying you're going to get out of the Army, this is what we need you to do right now. I got DA selected to be WTU cadre, which is the Warrior Transition Unit. So cadre in charge of guys coming back from combat and being wounded. And basically, I managed all of their appointments, everything. Like, obviously, I'm not a doctor. But the doctors would say, hey, this is what I need. I, I'd make sure they get to their appointments because some of these guys are on so many medications that they can't keep track of their own schedule. So that was my job is more just personnel management and getting yeah. people where they need to be. Um, was 
a really good intent by the army to put these units together, but what it turned into was a lot of command teams sending their shit bags to the WTU and saying they weren't fit for duty or like the malingers that like yeah. are just trying to get out of the army, get assigned there. So it was really fucking draining. Yeah. And I, that the whole time I did that job for, I don't know, 10 months. And the whole time I was just like, I can't do this for, it was like a three year assignment. And I was like, I can't do this for three years. So one day an article came up in the army times about some third group guys that had just won silver star for a fight that they were in. And I was sitting reading that article and I was just like, man, I always, I really liked when I got to, to be around those guys and see how they conducted themselves um, to see the level of professionalism. But then also they had a lot more freedom than I had. And you're like 25 at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I started just looking into it and I drove, we didn't have an SF recruiter on the base I was at. So I drove to Stuttgart where the SF recruiting team was and I sat down and I talked with them and I said, Hey, I'm in pretty decent shape. I think I can do this and I really want to. They looked through all my paperwork, all my test scores and everything were high enough to qualify for it. I was an E6 at this point, so I qualified on that end. So they're like, yeah, let's get you to selection. So I went to selection in November of 2014 and was first time go. But got before you get into that, when you were in Germany, I have to ask, did you ever haul ass on the Autobahn? Oh, yeah. Yeah. What was absolutely. the fastest you ever went? Um, did you hit 200 miles an hour? No, I never had a vehicle that could go that fast. <laughs> yeah. So personal vehicle was a Nissan Altima. Yeah. Um, and then we had the Gov government yeah. vans, and they put governors on all those. Of course. They yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Amen. Sorry. Yeah. I would like to go back and yeah. do it now. Uh, up until like six months ago, I had a WRX that had all kinds of work done to oh, it. Shit. And yeah, I went through uh, O'Neill's Rally Racing School up oh, in wow. New Hampshire. And I got back from that and was like, I'm fucking buying a rally car. Yeah. So That's I bought awesome. a WRX and I, you know, had an upgraded turbo, upgraded intake exhaust. What was it? Wheel, wheel horsepower pushing. I never had dyno. Yeah. Enough. For me. Yeah. Um, but it, this is also why I love motorcycles, but I've never owned a sports bike is because I know I'm going to go out there and kill myself on it. Yeah. I don't have the ability to turn it off. Like, I want to see what this thing can do. Yeah, I got you. So, but I did, I did get that thing up to the WRX on the back roads of Louisiana. I got that thing up to 160. No shit. Yeah. Wow. That's, uh, that's fucking good, man. Yeah. Those are cool cars. Uh, no, no two ways about it. They're they're kind of their own their own animal. But uh, man, they're so capable. Oh yeah, that's great. Um, oh. I, I get sidetracked and start talking about cars and motorcycles. <laughs> but, um, all right, so you go through selection at twenty fourteen. So at that point, now you're how old? No, I went through selection, and this was two thousand nine. Okay, I went through selection November two thousand nine. Um, and I was 24. Okay. Yeah. 24 when I went through selection, um, November and February. So three months later, I got my orders to report to brag for the Q course PCS over there less than two months in to the Q course got divorced from my first wife, mm -hmm. which, uh, was, added an extra layer of, of stress and yeah. some depression. Um, definitely made it a little bit harder, but at that point I used that, um, everything that was bottled up from that part of my life, I used that as the driving force to get through. Mm -hmm. Um, so in hindsight, I look at it as a blessing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I went through the Q course, got assigned as 18 Echo Communications for my MOS, and Posh 2 was the language. So first phase was language school, and that was about eight hours a day, five days a week, sitting in a classroom. For how, how long a duration? Six months. Six months. Yep. Did you go to, like, the DLI in Monterey, or were you at 
they did it at Bragg in the okay. language lab there. <laughs> yeah. So it was actually one of the hotels that they had on Bragg. They converted a couple floors into yeah. classrooms. Oh, okay. And so we would just get report. At, we would do PT with our cadre in the morning and then show up over there at the hotel and sit in a classroom. We had a little Afghan woman named Sarah that she would just teach us yeah. posture for eight hours a day. So, you know, six months of essentially total immersion language school. I mean, how would you rate yourself at the end of that six months in terms of fluency? Enough to build rapport with locals, but if we needed to try to extract information from them, I did not have enough skills to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So you're not uh, talking about how to disarm a nuclear bomb or anything? No. Yeah. No. All right. <laughs> how do you source some uranium for the flux capacitor? God damn it. <laughs> um, Man, that's wild. What do you have you retained any of it? Conversational stuff. If yeah. um if I met somebody from that area of Afghanistan where they speak Pashu, and yeah. the weird thing about Pashu is there's so many different dialects yeah. of it. It's very tribal. So <laughs> and that also made it hard to learn because we would have one instructor that was from this region of Afghanistan. And then we would work with her for a month or two months. And then we would get another instructor from a different region. And he would be like, oh, no, you're saying that all wrong. And we'd have to relearn half of what we already learned. Yeah, that would be tough. So, yeah, that definitely added yeah. to it all. But I would say I'm still good enough that I can, I can introduce myself. I can ask your name. Where are you from? And then beyond that, I'm going to be like, do you speak English? <laughs> uh, that's fucking great. Uh, all right, so you finished the language training, and then where did, where did you go from there? So after language training was small unit tactics, which I had a very base foundation in that. You know, so SUT, essentially, like, they get it's, it's teaching the Ranger hand, Handbook. And so I knew, like, basic L, amb L ambushes, how, or how to react to contact, everything like that. But I didn't know all of the ins and outs. I knew the very basics of patrolling. And so I really, at this point, you know, throughout the six months of language school and, and doing PT with the other students, you start to kind of get your group of friends. And I really latched on to the former Rangers that were crossing over yeah. because those guys know that shit mm -hmm. really well. And so there were a couple of key dudes that I got along with really well. And we already had that relationship built. So when we all went to SUT, I just <laughs> attached myself to them. And when I didn't understand anything, when we had some downtime, I'd be like, Hey, can you help me yeah. understand this? And so that was that was a huge lifesaver for me. Without them, I don't know that I would have made it past SUT. Wow. But it's also like my personality, and I don't know what this says about me, but I feed off other people's weakness. And SUT wasn't a joke. Like there were times where we would do 72-hour ops, come back and have six hours to sleep, and then go back out for another 72 hours. But when other people quit, that just feeds my fire. Yeah. So. What was the percentage of people that quit at that point in training? Man, I would say. Or that don't make it across the board. I would say it's 25% to a third. Wow. Of the people drop out or fail out because there's also a shooting package and if you don't get certain scores or you don't make certain times you get bumped out for that also so wow. yeah um okay so pretty high attrition rate there you lean on some uh, some former ranger dudes what what came after that seer school oh okay yep and uh the entire pipeline is about how long so mine was about a year and a half yeah um I only had, I never got recycled through anything. I did get pulled out of SEER because that divorce was getting finalized and I had to go to court. So they pulled me out for that. But, and then my, 
my ex-wife didn't even show up, but I wasn't really even fighting the divorce. So I was just like, okay, we're good. It's, yeah. it's final. All right. Um, and so I was in SEER for our SEER schools three weeks. At least it was at that time. After the first week, I got pulled out because we got notified that I had a court date, went to court. They gave me like a week to just make sure I had my head right and everything, and then went back through, but I had to start over from the yeah. beginning again, so I got to get slapped twice as much as everybody yeah. else. Yeah. Yeah, that's some wild shit. Yeah, so your school, man, it's a, <laughs> that was a trip for sure. Um, I had a blast in your school. Like yeah. y- you learned so much about yeah. yourself. No, for sure. I mean, while you're there, yeah, it's a it's a, a neat and unique experience. There's no no two ways about it. Um, so once you finished the entire pipeline, where where did you go uh, initially? Uh, Seventh Special Forces Group. Okay. Yep. And, and what was that like? Expectation versus reality. I think the expect the expectation i had was was pretty spot on by that point i had acquired quite a few mentors i was going to church at that point in my life and the church that i went to in north carolina had a lot of operators from the special forces community and also from the the delta community okay and so I had really built relationships with those guys and they really mentored me through the process of what to expect. So I feel like my expectations were pretty spot on when I got there. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Well, you, you mentioned, uh, you were going to church at that time. Is, uh, is that not something you participate in anymore? Is it not going to church? I still, I'm still a spiritual person. Um, I don't know. Every, church that I've been to in the, because I'll have phases where I'm like, I want to try to go back to church and every church that I've been to in like the last 10 years has been within the first or second time I go there, they start asking for money. Mm -hmm. And I understand like they have to survive, but it just always feels like you're just, trying to get money from me it feels like it's just been turned into a business yeah you know traditional religion has been turned into a business and i think there's ways to have spirituality and have faith without walking in those doors yeah i got you um i didn't i was just curious um so you you, so you get to seventh group uh it's about what you expect how long were you there before you deployed with them a month no shit. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Fucking fire hose. I'm drinking with the fire hose. So I, I signed into seventh group and I was in the group S1 office and somebody hangs up the phone and they're like, hey, you're an 18 Echo? And I was like, yeah. And they're like, with Poshu? And I was yeah. And they said, okay, we got, we know where we're putting you. And so seventh group command, sergeant major and commander, were Siege of Soda Fe command at the time. You know, it bounces around to different different groups, hold down the Siege of Soda base. And at the time, it was 7th group. And so they needed a PSD person to go over and work with them. So PSD, Personal Security Detachment. So it was a one-man detail. I was with a whole team, and that team was there in case we needed to do ground movements anywhere or if we had to do any advance on any area that they were going to go, and we moved by ground. But me being their personal PSD, I flew everywhere with them. And then even when the rest of the team didn't go, I still went with them anywhere. So it ended up being an awesome opportunity at first, my peers and guys that had been in group for years were like, this is going to suck. Try to just get through it and do a good job, but you're going to be attached to the commander and the sergeant major the whole time. And it's not going to be the same as a normal ODA deployment. So I just, I went in and I went in as the humble new guy. I'm here to learn it. Honestly, in my opinion, it ended up being an awesome opportunity for multiple reasons, one being I got to see the entire country mm-hmm. because of that, because they would do battlefield circulation Monday through Thursday, and then Friday through Sunday, they'd be back at Bagram doing their admin work. And 
So while they were out circulating, we would hit in those four days, we would hit, you know, three or four different ODAs in different parts of the country. And then when we came back, after I built trust with them, they let me go do what I wanted to do. And so, for instance, being a forward observer, I had a combat action badge, but I didn't have a combat infantry badge. And I told the sergeant major one day, I was like, hey, I'd really like to try to get a CIB. And I'm, is there is it possible for when you guys are here that I can go join other teams and give them the opportunity to let one of their guys have a night off and go out on, on ops with them? He was like, yeah, absolutely. So I started calling up people that I knew, um, team sergeants that I knew, saying, hey, would you mind if I came out, if I flew out because I had access to the air that the command used? And when they were staying, they didn't have a job either. So I just had to coordinate it all. So I'd go to the jock, find out who was getting in the most firefights at that time. That's awesome. Go to the air cell, say, hey, can I get a flight here? They'd fly me in, drop me for three days, and then come pick me up, and I'd get to go out and do my thing. And so there was a lot of learning. I got to learn the layout of the country, the differences between the fighting from the east and the west and the south and the north. I got to see how different ODAs operated, what their team dynamics were. And so being a new Green Beret in group, coming back from that deployment, I had a much better idea of what the overall organization was about. Yeah, man, that's a, it is an incredible opportunity. Were there, were there any um, operations that you went on that were just like epic fucking firefights? We did get into one big one. It was in the Kajur Valley. And a couple months prior, there was a blue and green incident um, where an Afghan that was working with us flipped and everybody was sitting around a fire and he ended up pulling a gun and killing a couple of green berets. And that whole village was pretty corrupt. So I flew out there and at the last minute, the group CSM decides he wants to go out there too. So I was like, fuck now these guys, these guys thought I was coming out to help. Now I'm bringing the flagpole with yeah. me and no, I'm going to be the asshole yeah. when we show <laughs> up. So we showed up and we went out. I like, as soon as we landed, like the bird was landing and rocket are coming in trying to take out the bird while it's on the ground. So the bird hightails it out of there. We get in to the compound. They had razors standing by. We jump in the razors. We get into the compound, go to sleep for the night. Nothing else happens. Actually, we, uh, we did have some small arms fire and I think there were many gun took out a couple dudes that night. And I was just like, man, this place is just constantly getting it. So, the next day, they're like, hey, we're going to go out on a patrol. I was still seeking my CIB at this point. And Sergeant Major tested me because those white phosphorus rockets that were coming in were close enough that that would have qualified me. But anybody that takes a CIB for indirect fire, like, yeah. come on. So I was like, I'm not going to write this up for my CIB award. So they're like, we're going to take you out into town. We always get shot at when we go through this area. So... Be prepared. Also, they gave one of their echoes a night or, or the day off. So I was carrying, do you remember those backpack jammers? Yeah. With like the antenna that sticks up six feet and then it has like six yeah. other antennas coming yeah. out of it. You got to carry that. I'm carrying that on my back. And it sucks because the whole time you're wearing Peltors, it's just buzzing <clears throat> and it sounds like a swarm of bees around your head and you can't hear anything. But I'm carrying that and I'm walking around and all of a sudden we start getting small arms fire so we get down in this ditch Ge we know the general direction of where this is coming from so we just start laying down covering fire while everybody's getting down and then it would stop we'd start to get up out of the ditch and they'd open up with pkms from another position return fire it would stop get up open up again this went on long enough to where we were getting close to going black on ammo and we knew we needed to get fast movers in there because we couldn't get any sort of resupply because we were taking too much contact. 
So we need to get fast movers to clear them out. So there was this known Taliban Kalat about a hundred meters away from us. And in hindsight, I, I think I beat myself up a little bit about this because my job with the command sergeant major there is to protect him. Mm -hmm. With that being said, you like he wanted to fight. So like if like I would have to like physically restrain him at some point, some points to like, Hey, just stay in this ditch. Let them do it. But I was JFO qualified. I could talk to birds. We had a JTAC too. And they're like, we need to get guys in that compound. So I was like, Hey, I'll move with you. The JTAC was right next to me. Sergeant majors on the other side told the Sergeant major stay here, told the guy next to him, you're in charge. I'm going to go with him. We're going to get on this rooftop and we're going to get fast movers in here. So we're running and it's one of those compounds with like the huge 10 foot wall built around it. So we're running along that wall and there's PKM rounds that are just impacting the wall right behind us as we're running along it. Like we're trying to outrun this gunfire. We get in and I still have this jammer on my back. We get into the main walls. We know this is an enemy compound. We don't know how many guys are in there and there's only two of us. So luckily there was nobody inside, but we don't know that. So we have to enter every room as if there were possibly someone in there. So the way this process went is I would breach the door, kick it in. The JTAC would go in first, clear it. And then I would have to bend that antenna down and kind of waddle because those doors are only like four and a half feet tall and I'm six, three. So I'd have to bend that antenna down and waddle in backwards ass first and then we'd move on to the next room. Once we had the whole compound cleared, we climbed up onto the rooftop and we eventually got tornadoes to come in and clear the area out for us. Wow. Um, so British? Yeah. Oh, shit. Yep. I, I mean, I, I guess I didn't realize that there was a, a re, not recurring, that, that it was normal for you guys to call in other forces, um, air assets. Is I that think at that point it was just whoever was in the area. Yeah they were out there and so they came in and they they took care of it for us and we flew back to bagram that night me and the sergeant major flew back to bagram and we went to chow like as soon as we got off the bird dropped our bags off at the room dinner chow was being served we get into the chow hall and somebody had made a bunch of pictures like caricature caricature style pictures of me in full battle rattle with a baby Bjorn and the Sergeant Major <laughs> in the baby Bjorn running with like an explosion yeah, in the background great. and they hung them up everywhere. It was yeah, pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. Um, did you notice a disparity between uh, the British pilots and American pilots in terms of not competency, but just the, the protocols? Like it was it everybody on the same page and it's like talking to an American pilot or did you have to make accommodations for different assets that way so you know so being a forward observer i spoke a lot to artillery whether it was cannons mortarmen whatever those guys like it's very specific like certain words this is how you say it. you don't vary from that pilots are a lot different it's yeah. like hey man i'm right here do you see me just talk to me Yep. Talk to me, Goose. Okay, do you see this? All right, your rounds can't go past that. Yeah. And then, like, you, you just have to make sure, get the point across, this is my furthest guy, this is the enemy, yeah. and this is the cutoff line. And, yeah, they're like, cut all this bullshit, this, cut yeah. all that out and just talk, yeah. just have a conversation yeah. with me and get the point across. Yeah. Were there any that you had a hard time understanding? Not really. Yeah. Did you did you ever work with any other nationalities uh, pilots? Australians were they har harder to understand? Sometimes, yeah, yeah, yeah. What yeah. were they flying? Same tornadoes? Um, no, with them it was generally helicopters that I was oh, talking okay. to. Yeah, helos. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Do you have a a favorite close air support story? I mean, everybody loves an A ten. Yeah um because they'll fly low and, and they sound awesome and they sound awesome I'm like an they American look muscle cool car. um you know and now i think there's there's a lot of politicians getting involved to save the a10 program it's still a relevant platform 
Absolutely. I mean, that's the reality of it. Like, absolutely. Even as old as it is, it still absolutely has a place in the yeah. arsenal, you know? Yeah. Um, man, that's fucking cool. Did, uh, and it's a little more personal. It's it's more up close. A, exactly. You know. They'll fly low and slow, and they'll get yeah. in the fight. To me, it, it it kind of combines the best of of both fixed wing and rotary wing. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's kind of like that happy medium. You know, um, mm-hmm. yeah, that's cool. Did you uh, use them and smoke the shit out of somebody or what? Oh yeah. Can you okay. tell us that story quick? Um, we were out in this wadi. We were actually putting in a cache site, and they ended up we ended up having trucks moving up on us and we could see that these were mounted enemy trucks with mounted weapons coming in and they started maneuvering and shooting on us and before they even got close enough for their rounds to have an impact there were a10s in the area and they did a sweep over and just took out the trucks yeah that's cool yeah do you have, did you keep or have you kept track of how many times you've called in close air support in real world scenarios no i mean could you put a ballpark so we almost always had a jtac or a cct with us yeah in sf so army we didn't always have those assets available and so i probably had more in the regular army yeah um than in sf yeah but yeah probably 20 times oh shit yeah wow that's amazing that's uh, that's really cool. Any uh, super close calls where you almost called it in on yourself? No. Yeah, you were good about that. I was good about that. I did. Guy that I went through the Q course with um, was a part of a, a tragic mission where bombs got dropped on part of his ODA. Man. Yeah. That's fucking uh, brutal. Yeah. Man. Um, all right, so you used that first deployment which was a quick turnaround from when you got there great opportunity to get a good kind of foundation laid of the lay of the land etc how long was that deployment six months so you come home from that um how long were you home before you jumped in and went back at it so i got home and i had been placed on the team that was going over to do the b doc mission it was never intended to be my permanent team, so... And BDOC is what? Base Defense Operations Center. Um, so it was the the S. So at Bagram, the SF compound there, they were basically the SF team that was in charge of running that compound. So anytime anybody needed to move, they would throw them in trucks, take them to wherever they needed to go. Um, I was stuck directly with the commander and sergeant major, but then when the commander and sergeant major weren't going out, I would jump in with them. If we got into shit and air couldn't come support us, they would jump in trucks and come support us. So I became a part of their team, and that was mountain team in 4th Battalion, 7th Special Forces Group. And we got back from that deployment. It was never intended for me to stay on that team after that. I was just like on loan to them. And so I went to the dive team after I got back. Key West? Um, I actually never went to CDQC. Really? Um, instead, right after I got assigned to the dive team, I got a Sephardic slot. Um, which what does is Sephardic a, stand for? <laughs> Quizzing you on Special all Forces, stuff. Advanced Reconnaissance, Target Analysis, and Exploitation Techniques course. That's a mouthful. Yeah. That's what she said. Um, and it's essentially a long acronym to confuse people. What it is is it's yeah. it's our direct action school. Yeah. Um, well, I just call it DA school. Yeah. But politics, yeah. I don't know. And the acronym guy's out of a job. Yeah. Yeah. So, and Sephardic is a big opportunity, especially for a new guy. Most of the guys that go there have been waiting for a slot for a long time. There was somebody in my company that was slotted to go, and like two weeks before his date, he got a DUI, and oh, his wow. clearance got pulled. Yeah. So we had been going through our train-up for the next deployment, and I had the highest shooting scores on the team. So my team sergeant was like, hey, do you want to take this slot? I was like, fuck yeah, because that's, you know, that's always, and we can talk more about this, but that's always where I wanted my career to go. I didn't love being a comms guy. Yeah. I wanted to be a gun guy. I was given the option when I finished selection 
to either be an 18 Bravo or sorry, an 18 Echo Camo or an 18 Delta Medic when I wanted to be an 18 Bravo weapons. Yeah. yeah. Um, Did your uh, dad uh, teach you slash take you shooting much growing up? No. No. Mm -mm. Just had a knack for it. Yeah. 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 Um, so they gave me the opportunity. They, they asked me if I wanted to go. I said, yeah, my team sergeant sat me down and tried to calm my nerves. He's like, hey, man, you're young. This isn't going to, if you don't pass, it's not going to ruin your career. So just eliminate as much stress about that as you can and just go there and learn. Yeah. So I went and turned out I actually made it. And I don't think they expected me to. But I made it all the way through. And, you know, again, so one of those Rangers that I relied on during SUT, he was also in my Sephardic class. And so it was comforting to have, like, a peer that I already knew. And then, like, some of the instructors I had in the Q course were there, too. And so mm -hmm. that I wanted to, like, impress them yeah. as well. So I really did. I just went into it every day. I didn't really anticipate a lot. I didn't really get in my head, get too nervous. I wasn't the best shooter out there. Wasn't the worst. Um, some guys just overthink things and, and it just takes over. Yeah. I never had that problem. I was, a, I just focused one problem first, like one foot in front of the other. Yeah. And so I went in and that's about a three month long course was successful and got back to group because I went from Florida to Bragg for that course. Got back, and that was when I did my second deployment with 7th Group. And uh, was that to back to Afghanistan? Yep. Yeah. How, how was that compared to everything else that you'd done uh, oper operational tempo activity-wise? So that was a, tra a traditional, at least for the time, that was a traditional SF deployment. We were doing – Village stabilization operations at the time. Or destabilization, as it were. Yeah. <laughs> what uh, was it? I mean, pretty busy. Yeah, it, it definitely was. We were we were going out pretty regularly, except during Ramadan, because, it, you know, at that point, we have to have a certain Afghan to U.S. ratio every time we'd leave the wire. Yeah, that sucks. And, and I think it was like almost double. So it was like, if we took a 12 man ODA out, you had to have at least 24 Afghans with you. Man. What, what was your take on, uh, on their level of competency? And I know, you know, even within a group of 24, there's some good, some bad, but like if you, if you take kind of an overall mean average, uh, it's like herding cats. Yeah. So that they were about like all the rest of them. Cause I know that there, there were, or, you know, th there were instances or, examples of certain units that were that were pretty good yeah some of the the a and asf guys their special operations guys yeah. those guys were usually pretty pretty turned on yeah you know you would still have to micromanage them a little bit but not nearly as much as just the standard right afghan national army guy yeah okay so mo so most of the guys you were going out with were standard army guys yeah, unless we were doing very specific operations. Yeah. Um, if we were doing a lot of clearing operations, then we would have A and ASF guys with us. Yeah. If we were going out to deliberately hit a target, we would have A and ASF guys. But if we were just doing presence patrols in an area or meet and greets with local, yeah, you know the the D cop or whatever, we would. It, it would be the SFDs and they're like, it's like, it, it reminds me of me when I played little league in third grade and I was like more prone to like picking grass and then paying attention to what yeah. was going on. Yeah. They're awesome. like picking fruit from trees yeah. and like, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's fucking funny. Um, during that deployment, were there any operations that were legit like, Checking over the hornet's nest, gunfight type uh, type missions. Where I was, there were other ODAs from my company that were were in some pretty hot areas. Where I was, we didn't take too much. Yeah. Um, did, did any of them stand out as being noteworthy, worth worth sharing? For the sake of the story, um, one. And it wasn't necessarily a combat 
reason why it stuck out. But we were doing clearing operations. We were out for like five days and going village to village, sweeping through, looking for insurgents. At the same time, the other ODAs in the area were doing the same, and we were all converging on one location with the intent being that we would push all insurgents into that area, and on day five, it was going to be an all-out gunfight. Prior, the night before that happened, we we had been out for probably four days at this point, and I we had set up outside of the village on the only road that goes out to make sure nobody tried to exit in the middle of the night. And we had three trucks set up in a triangle formation. And I had made, we also had some regular army uplift guys that were pulling security for us. So I had made the guard roster for the night for those dudes, made sure everybody knew when their shift was. All my work was done. Now it's time for me to bed down and get some sleep. And I hadn't gotten much sleep in the three days prior to that. So I remember thinking I need to climb up on this. It was an RG 33 big truck sits. I don't know. What would you say? 12, 13 feet off the ground. Pretty. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my rucksack was strapped up to the top. I needed to climb up there, get my bed gear, change my socks and t-shirt. And then I was going to get some, some sleep. Yeah. Last thing, that's the last thing I remember. The next thing I know is a medevac bird is landing on my face. No shit. You fall off that motherfucker? That's what I think happened. Unfortunately, nobody saw it. What happened was our bomb dog started barking, and I was on the ground just shaking. And my senior Bravo on my team or my medic was like, hey, is Zach all right? And my Bravo was like, he's messing with the dog because I did used to joke <laughs> around a lot. So the dog was trying to alert them, hey, something's going on over here that's not normal. And my senior Bravo was like, he's fucking with the dog. And they just left me there for like a couple minutes. And then finally my medic came over and my eyes were rolled back in my head. And my face was turning purple. Damn. And I was having a full-blown seizure Wow, on the ground. So they called in and I was, you know, this went on for a couple minutes before I gained consciousness. So they called in a medevac. The medevac comes in and this is a, a whole nother story. The, we had marked the LZ probably, I don't know, 100, 150 meters away from where the trucks were. But the trucks were also in like a Y formation and we marked the LZ with an inverted Y. So the birds decided to try to land in the middle of the trucks, which were not spaced far enough for a bird to land there. So they browned out. They almost, they came down low enough that they almost, the rotors almost took out the trucks. Jeez. And we would have had an even bigger situation. But they lifted at the last minute, circled, came in a second time, and tried to do the same exact thing. Browned out again. At this point, I'm conscious. I've got an IV in. And I looked at my medic, and I was like, I'm not fucking getting on that helicopter. And they finally mar they finally went over and landed where we marked the spot and they got me on stretchers and they took me over there and they flew me back to Kandahar and but they didn't ever do any real testing. So as soon as I got back, all of the regular army doctors left the room and the SF med team that we had came in and they told me hey, we think you had a seizure, but if we report this as a seizure, your career's over. So we're going to write this off as you were dehydrated, sleep deprived, and you passed out. And you're going to go back out to your team. And we're just going to hope that this doesn't happen again. So I finished the deployment. Did Before you get into that, I mean, so you missed that fifth day. Yeah. Did, did that go down as prescribed? I remember... Being because I stayed at the hospital on calf just for like eight hours so they could observe me. And then I went back over to the SF compound on Kandahar and I was in the jock listening as all of it was taking place. And there were definitely some fights and there were definitely some captured. Yeah. But I don't believe it was as big as we thought it was going to be. Yeah. Uh, before you get further into the, the seizures and, and how that kind of 
impacted your career. Uh, do you have any good dog stories? I brought a dog back from Iraq. Yeah. I mean, I guess the working dog were any, <laughs> any of the dogs you were with ever fuck anybody up that you got to witness? Um, no, all the working dogs that I had were bomb dogs. Yeah. And like single purpose. Yeah. yeah. Um, I did have a good buddy that was a dog handler. I worked with him later on in life. I was an SRT instructor for DOD. And one of the guys that I worked with was a dog handler in the unit. Yeah. And he would tell me some. All kinds of good shit. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like this dog. Like, What are the odds of getting him on here? I bet I could do it. Yeah. For sure. Let's uh, let's try to make that. Yeah. Uh, sorry. So anyway, um, I get I get fucking sidetracked. I'm like the uh, the Afghan army guys picking fucking fruit over here. <laughs> I think I, I, I flatlined while I was in there. They didn't even realize my wife was like curled up in the fetal position in the corner of the room while they're bringing me back. <laughs>